यूट्यूब मध्य पोस्ट कर फिर एक मिनट बेल मध्य ईमेल ओपन हो जाए लिंक थे वो दे होता है मैं तो गुड आफ्टरनून प्रभु सर प्रभु सर
Good morning, Claus. How are you? Good morning, Bipul. I'm doing fine, thanks. <laughs> hey. Okay, good. Good, mo good morning, Dr. Bipul. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good, good, good morning, Claus. Good afternoon. Good, morning. good afternoon. Yeah. yeah, it's morning. Yeah, good morning <laughs> there, you know, yeah. It's 10. And in your place, it's afternoon. Yeah, it's afternoon, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's very pleasure. It's pleasure. Good. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, really, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Very, very excited and very eager to just looking forward to hear you, sir. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to yeah. present some of my ideas and what yeah, we are doing yeah. teaching. Most welcome, sir. Yeah. So the, I have learned the audience is teachers educating uh, children or is it teachers at the university? No, no, they, they, they are mixed, you know, but mainly, you know, they are senior students, maybe uh, master's ah. students and uh, faculty, those who are taking undergraduate classes, postgraduate classes. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Then I have targeted the right, the right audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Some of the research scholars, master's students and uh, undergraduate teachers, undergraduate and postgraduate yeah. teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I I'll just um, give me a few minutes. I have to take to look for a glass of water and my check in and so on. Yeah, yeah, I'll be please, back please. in a few minutes. Yes, yes. Take your time. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And people, congratulations to our shared publication. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So we, we all have joined well before time, huh? well before time. Yeah, and we'll start uh, sharp at three o'clock. Yeah, we on, on time, on time, definitely. Hey, Gurunale, Professor Gurunale, where are you? Where are you? Are? Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor Gurunale. Yeah.
Tak besar. Tak besar. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Vasudev Ji. How are you? Good afternoon, sir. Good Sir, it's okay, it's okay. All the best. Prabhu, sir, namaste. Thank you, sir. Parisa, Ji Ji. Yes, sir, namaste, sir. So nice to see you. Namaskar. Dr. Hemant Pandey. Namaskar, namaskar. Namaskar. Sir, you're coming, right? 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 Hello, Hemant Pandey Ji. Namaskar. Namaskar. How are you? बढ़िया गुरु नल सर द स्ट्रीमिंग द स्ट्रीमिंग हैज स्टार्टेड आई मीन पीपल आर ज्वाइनिंग देयर यस गुरु नल यस यस सर Hello. Hello, Dr. Chalu, madam. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I hope I'm audible properly. Yeah, yeah, madam. You are audible and voice is clear. Okay. Okay, sir. So we'll start yeah. by uh, at three. Uh -huh. We will start uh, exactly at three o'clock. Okay. Sure, sure, sir. Yeah. गुरु सर मजा आवाज ये तो है ना क्लियर ये तो है सर हाँ बस ठीक है तेज चेक करना महत्व आता है <laughs> श्रद्धा गुड आफ्टरनून सर अच्छे हैं एकदम बढ़िया डॉक्टर विपुल शाह गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून कैन यू हियर मी क्लियरली यस यस एम आई ऑडिबल यस श्योर ओके
Hello. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good, good afternoon, Professor Klaus Kumler. Hello, Professor Klaus. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Gunule. Dr. Gunule. Gunule. Yeah, yeah, sir. Good. Good to see you. Yeah, we had some email exchange. Yeah, 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 sir. Nice so to I see you. You're doing well. Yeah, 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 sir. Good afternoon, Professor Klaus. I'm DB Prabhu, Association of Chemistry Teachers in India. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. And thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to present. Yeah. Uh, Professor Klaus, uh, Professor D.V. Prabhu is the General Secretary of Association of Chemistry Teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Welcome, sir. Welcome. So I, I have heard we are just expecting a huge crowd in the, as the audience. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe because we already made it uh, to different organizations and already we have sent a mail and uh, talked with the people. So we are expecting a very huge crowd. Oh, thank you, uh, sir. Really good. <laughs> I'm sure we will have a big crowd listening to you, sir. Good. And how is the situation in India these days as for the pandemic? Yeah, situation was quite okay till last week, no? But last 10, 8 to 10 days, you know, again we are getting the cases. And uh, now it's really serious. Even the Prime Minister yesterday spoke, you know, with the all the Chief Minister of the States. And he's shown really concerned. But the cases are coming up. And mm -hmm. really, you know, the situation is again the second wave, rather, you know, in a very general term. So yeah. otherwise, last some couple of months, you know, it, the life here is quite normal, you know, the university and colleges are almost open. Schools are not open, of course. The markets are open, all other establishments are open business establishments. But now the cases are increasing gradually for the last almost eight, ten days. Oh, I see. Yeah, we have uh, the same situation. So we are expecting the third wave. Uh -huh. Yeah, that is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very challenging. On the one hand, you have to reopen for people, yeah. for education, for economy. On the mm. other hand, if you reopen, then probably it starts again. Yeah, and so yeah, hopefully the vaccines will help. We will see. Yeah, we, I got vaccinated. That is the, I think the Dr. Prabhu also got vaccinated. I got vaccinated on this uh, last yeah. week. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. Co <laughs> COVID shield. And everything was okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 
our government has started vaccination on a large scale. Yeah. Almost about three crores that have been already vaccinated. Very good. Yeah. We are a little bit behind. <laughs> Uh, by the way, the connection is okay for you, and I'm yes, easy to understand. Okay. No, no, it, it is clear, sir. Yeah. Yeah, because I had some issues uh, yesterday. Okay. Uh, will work. Yeah. Now the connection is okay. Very good. People, you are in the institute, or where are you? You have a nice background. Yeah, I am in the institute right now. We have our R and D center. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm in the institute right now. I see. Yeah, I'm, I'm at home because uh, our university is closed. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. But our R&D center is now operating since last two months. Yeah, yeah. The research labs are also running on a low level, but all the teaching is online. Right. Uh -huh. yeah, so we have we have videotaped all the the uh, practicals, the, ex the experiments. Yeah, and the students have to watch and have to ask. I have to answer questions, etc. Not the best solution because for chemistry you should also be in the lab, but better than nothing. And maybe in summer we can reopen and then they can do it. Same here, but there's no fun without doing the experiments in the lab. That's what yeah. I was saying. That we would like to be in the lab, but then we can't oblige them because of this COVID pandemic. Yeah. For chemistry, we need to do the experiments. And this pandemic, we are not able to do it. That is unfortunate yeah. part. Yeah, that's a challenge. And therefore, we challenge. first we thought we can do it with smaller groups, but then it right. turned out uh, we, we have to disinfect everything and it's not, not possible. So we decided right. to videotape all the experiments mm. and the students then at least can see it. And also there are some interactive things like that you can uh, uh, build together an apparatus you know, for distillation, for example, yeah, and then we can check online whether they did it correctly. And, but that's only a, a substitute. So, and also I talked to the president of my university to make clear that online teaching in the lab is not an option for future to save money. Right. Yeah. It also turned out that you cannot save stuff with doing online teaching because... Yeah. You need the stuff for other things in the background, mm. and yeah, now I think now it's clarified. They have accepted this. <clears throat> Few people they have started doing an experiment. They started developing a small kit, you know, mm. and the teacher is demonstrating that experiment in uh, on the online, and the student is performing that experiment at the kit at home. It's a small uh -huh. kit, of course, and instead of a burette and pipette, he has used the syringes. All right. Yeah. So by using syringe, you can add drop by drop and just do the titration, yeah, something yeah. like that. So, I mean, the people, they are trying to innovate. And that is yeah. very, it's a need of the day now, isn't it? If suppose this continues for a long time, we may not be able to conduct the practicals at all. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but so we as need, you said, it's also so, um, a move into the future. I think it will change our teaching. It will change, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It yeah has we call, what you're describing, we call kitchen chemistry. So... Let's see what you can learn using the things you have at home in right, your, right, right. your household on the one hand and all the videotaped material we will use in future, right. again, right. for preparing for the practicals. Right, so right. listen to the video and then there will be a, a, a small oral examination and then you can go to the lab. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not, not all is very bad about uh, the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, there is a silver lining. Yeah. But sir, no, see, we are talking at the level of, you know, they are at least undergraduate and, you know, secondary level students. But the younger students, no, they are in the primary level or upper primary kind of, now they are getting bored and, you know, they are just running away from it. I mm -hmm. mean, this is somewhere, you know, uh, excessive for them, you know. Yeah. 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 And the most important thing is, I, I think we have to be optimistic. Optimistic. That's the true. opportunities. Yeah. 
Yeah, Dr. Charu, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Ranaji. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Ranajit, my friend has joined from USA. Oh, good. Most welcome, sir. Chukuri Sinevas TV Prabhu speaking. Yeah. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Welcome, Srinivas. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Baba Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. <laughs> Shall we start? Oh. Okay, sir, Pali, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Three o'clock now. We yes, can sir. Start now. Start three. Doctor Chalu, madam, start now. Uh, so, namaskar, everyone. On behalf of the Association of Chemistry Teachers, I, Doctor Chalu Jamaria, welcome you all to the international webinar on sustainable chemistry. Uh, the Association of Chemistry Teachers, that is ACT, was conceptualized by Homi Bhabha Center for Science Education, Mumbai, in 2000. And since its establishment, the association has been continuously working towards strengthening education in chemistry. It is a privilege of the association to have renowned chemical scientists of the country, Bharat Ratna Professor C.N.R. Rao, Padma Bhushan Vibhushan Professor M.N. Sharma, and Padmashri Professor J.P. Mittal as honorary members. The major objective of the association is to bring together higher school, higher secondary school teachers, college and university lecturers, professors, scientists and researchers and industries on a common platform to share and enhance their knowledge. So to fulfill its objective, the zonal councils of the association regularly organizes several events at national and international level, like workshops on instrumentation, national convention on chemistry teachers, chemistry Olympiad, international conference on green chemistry, to name a few. The ACT also honors teachers for their outstanding contribution in the subject by giving away several awards. In continuation with several earlier, earlier organized events, the theme of the today's webinar is Sustainable Chemistry. As we all know that rapid development is continuously degrading our environment with addition of a mixture of chemicals in the environmental components producing profound effect on human health. Thus, the need of the R is to understand and implement the concept of sustainable chemistry in all our developmental activities. As we all know, sustainable chemistry, this refers to a scientific concept that seeks to improve the efficiency with which natural resources are used to meet human needs for chemical products and services. So to understand this concept with an aim to implement, uh, implement it in future research, we are connected at present with 4,233 participants from around 26 countries all over the globe, including the countries like Nigeria, Bangladesh, Philippines, Pakistan, Oman, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Libya, South Korea, Canada, Yemen, Nepal, Tehran, and Iran. And the event is also being streamed live on YouTube. Now, after this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Professor D.V. Prabhu, General Secretary ACT, for the introductory address. Dr. D.V. Prabhu is the Exec Professor and former Head, Department of Chemistry, Wilson College, Mumbai. His research interests are reaction kinetics, catalysis, and environmental chemistry. He has guided eight students for their research degrees and published 58 papers in National and International Journal of Repute. He, uh, he is an elected fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, London, UK, in May 2019, 
and has also received best teacher awards of chemical research society of india in 2006 and association of kinetics of india award of indian chemical society in 2002 i welcome you sir dr dv prabhu i welcome you sir thank you madam charu jab i was very distinguished speaker of the day pass me the camera uh, uh, president of dr bipul sa ayupak bureau member acit vice president west zone the convener of this international webinar professor vasudev gurnule friends from india and all over the world on behalf of the association of chemistry teachers i welcome our very distinguished speaker professor klaus kumar director institute of sustainable and environmental chemistry lufthansa university germany association of chemistry teachers is proud to collaborate with iupac in organizing this international webinar on sustainable chemistry professor kumar is a very renowned authority on sustainable chemistry and today will be speaking on sustainable chemistry as a future guiding principle today the two most important challenges before mankind are one sustainable development and two conservation of the environment there has been a vigorous debate between the two and we have come to the conclusion that a balance has to be struck between the two that is development and conservation <coughs> so that the future of humanity is secure sustainable development aims at the design of which minimize the use and generation of environmentally hazardous materials sustainable chemistry is based on the 12 principles of green chemistry initiated by paul anastas and john warner in the 1990s these 12 principles provide a blueprint for sustainable development today greening of chemistry is been done in labs and industries all over the world including india using green solvents green green catalysts etc green reagents increase atom economy and the reaction yield so that wastage is minimized and i am happy that in most universities in our country we are turning to green experiments where the consumption of materials is lessened and the emissions are minimized a few words about our association the association of chemistry teachers is a national registered body of chemistry educators of india and has been promoting excellence in chemistry education since it started way back in 2000 so we are 20 years young and through our various activities we are trying to promote chemistry education and research some of these activities have been mentioned national and international conferences training workshops webinars especially during the covid pandemic pandemic then competitions for school and college children a concept test in chemistry for graduate students the association is actively involved in the indian national and international chemistry olympiad program testing and training of the teams every year act also honors the very outstanding teachers of our country by giving them awards in the national convention of chemistry teachers held last year in december we are more than six international speakers the president of the royal chemistry society and the american chemical society it was for the first time 
that the National Convention had international speakers. The Association of Chemistry Teachers has a large network of teachers who volunteer to do many activities, not only in the big cities, but in the smaller cities and smaller towns. The association also supports academically a peer-reviewed chemistry journal, GP Globalized Research Journal of Chemistry, which is abstracted and indexed in the Chemical Abstracts CAS of USA. The journal does not charge any fees for publication of papers because we believe that no fees should be charged for publication. A paper should be published on its own merit, not because some money is given. I would invite all of you to submit papers to our journal. On behalf of the association, I would like to thank very profusely Professor Vasudev Gurmule and Dr. Bipul Saha for organizing this international webinar. Of course, heartfelt thanks to Professor Claus for finding time to be with us this afternoon. I wish the international webinar a grand success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Now, to proceed with, I would like to welcome Dr. Vipul Saha, IPEC member, URA member, for his special address. Dr. Bipul Saha is at present Director, Research and Development at NACL Industries Limited, Hyderabad. Dr. Saha is closely associated with International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, and he has been elected as member of IPA uh, Bureau for the period 2023. I would also like to share that in the last 100 years history of IPAC, Dr. B. Saha, is the third person from India to be elected in this position. He is also executive committee member and secretary of the Committee on Chemistry and Industry and the first Indian to hold the position. Dr. Saha was national representative of India in IPAC Division of Chemistry and Environment and was member of Interdivisional Committee on Green Chemistry for Sustainable Development. I welcome you, sir. I welcome Dr. Bipul Saha for his uh, special address. Good afternoon, uh, respected Professor Vijesh Pade, President of the Association of Chemistry Teachers, Professor Prabhu, Professor Gurnule, and today's invited speaker, eminent scientist, Professor Klaus Kumirara, ladies and gentlemen. I am indeed very happy to be present in today's webinar organized by the Association of Chemistry Teachers of India and supported by IUPAC. As you all know, IUPAC is one of the largest global organization of chemistry professionals. And all of you have studied IUPAC system of nomenclature of compounds. Well, uh, IUPAC does many more things than the nomenclature, which we can discuss in a separate meeting. As member of IUPAC Bureau, which is the highest governing body of IUPAC, I am trying to build relationship between IUPAC and other organizations. Sometime back, uh, Professor Vijesh Pare uh, requested me to explore the possibility of organizing an webinar involving a reputed scientist from IUPAC. In that context, I contacted Professor Klaus Kumerer he is a very well-known scientist globally for his work on sustainable chemistry, sustainable pharmacy, and related topics. Uh, Professor Kumedar is also closely associated with IUPAC. He is the titular member of IUPAC Interdivisional Committee on Green Chemistry for Sustainable Development. So Professor Kumedar accepted our uh, invitation, and I'm very glad that uh, a scientist of Professor Claus's stature and reputation has agreed to participate in this webinar and he's with us today. Uh, Association of Chemistry Teachers is a very dynamic organization. Uh, to give an example uh, of their activity, 
uh, recently IUPAC had organized the Global Women's Breakfast Program on 9 February. This is a program where we discuss about the women scientists participation in science and then their issues and also the uh, uh, their career development and uh, gender uh, equality and all those type of things. Now 70 countries participated in, in that event and uh, there are 324 total number of events globally. And I'm glad to inform that in India, there were 61 events. That is 18% of the total events were in India. And that was primarily due to the uh, initiative of the uh, Association of Chemistry Teachers. Uh, uh, they really uh, promoted this program and could uh, encourage many universities, institutes to participate in this program. So I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Association of Chemistry Teachers and their members for active participation in an IUPAC program. Now, India has good reputation for chemistry education and many uh, Indian students are occupying very important positions, both in the industry and the academics. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, we have Acharya Prafulla Chandra Rai, who was a pioneer for chemical industry in India. Then we have got Professor CNR Rao, Professor M.M. Sharma, and also uh, we have got Nobel laureate Professor Hargavind Khurana. Uh, so all of them have uh, made us proud, and there has been great contribution of chemistry teachers to shape their career. Uh, in the same way, members of the Association of Chemistry Teachers are shaping the careers of current Indian students, and I'm sure many of them will be occupying very important roles in academics and industry in coming years. However, I have one small observation. Uh, in India, uh, in most of the universities and institutes, bearing a few universities, uh, we confine our studies to traditional subjects like organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, physical chemistry, analytical chemistry. Uh, these are basics of uh, uh, chemistry and we have to continue to learn those subjects. But at the same time, we have to embrace new subjects like sustainable chemistry, green chemistry, systems thinking in chemistry. These are the emerging topics which we must embrace and include in our uh, syllabus. Uh, in this context, I'm very happy that Professor uh, Klaus will deliver a speech on sustainable chemistry in this. Uh, today in this program, we are expecting a very large number of participation, but I don't know, there may be some communication gap or whatever Professor Gundula can uh, say, because we are expecting uh, many participants, whether the link has been properly uh, sent or not, I do not know. Uh, but I think that will, this program is also being streamed live in YouTube uh, and uh, other channels. So. Uh, I take this opportunity to again thank Professor Claus for accepting our invitation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Now, I welcome Professor Brijesh Pare, President, Association of Chemistry Teachers, for his presidential address. Professor Pare is presently heading the Department of Chemistry at Madhav Science Postgraduate College affiliated to Vikram University at Ujjain. Professor Pari has received postdoctoral research fellowship from National Research Foundation, Pretoria from May 1999 to May 2000, and he worked in the Department of Chemistry, University of Durban, West Vede, South Africa. His research interests include green technologies, photocatalysts, degradation of organic pollutants, and he is working on novel method of teaching and learning phenomena based learning. Mm -hmm. Professor Pare is also serving as referee for various renowned journals like Journal of Physical Chemistry published by American Chemical Society, Washington, International Journal of Chemical Kinetics published by Vele from USA, Main Group Chemistry Taylor and Francis Group, UK, to name a few. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Charu, for this uh, uh, introduction. Thank you very much. So, Professor Klaus Kamral, the Director, Institute of Sustainable and Environmental Chemistry, and of course, the Chair of Sustainable Chemistry and Materials uh, Resources at uh, uh, Luf uh, Lufana University, Germany. Thank you very much, Professor Klaus, for uh, having sparing time for us, and uh, Professor D.V. Prabhu, General Secretary, SCT, Dr. Bipul Saha, IUPSC representative in India, 
uh, all my dear colleagues from SET, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Upinder Dhar, you know, the Vice Chancellor of Shri Vaishnav Vidyapit University in Daur. He has also joined, just I'm seeing, and the participants of this program for almost 23 countries. Uh, more than 4,000 uh, participants have registered. Uh, Professor Bipul Saha, you know, you are just showing the concern for the number. No, this is, you are uh, seeing the number in the Zoom only. The streaming number is quite different. I, I hope uh, Professor Gurnale will let us know the number, you know. So there is a very good uh, participation for this program. Uh, and it's, it's really a great pleasure to have Professor Klaus uh, uh, with us today. Uh, listening to him will be really a treat uh, on a topic such as a sustainable chemistry. And this particular topic is uh, really more relevant than before because of the, the changing wild scenario and particularly the pandemic. And I, I assure you, uh, Professor Klaus, you know, that your talk today will going to open a window for many Indian teachers and students and institutes. Because, you know, what uh, recently uh, the Bipul has said, you know, that uh, in Indian context, you know, sometimes this particular topic, we read and, I mean, teach about it, uh, but in a very part, you know, it, it has never been so far, you know, a very, very, uh, a, I mean, uh, an open topic, you know, and a full, full kind of a degree. And some of the institutes in IITs in India, they are doing it, you know, but by and large, we are we are having only just as a part of this. And sustainable chemistry and green chemistry, uh, almost for the last 20 years, just going hand in hand. And we do teach, you know, and our students only in a part. So I, I hope today's talk, you know, is going to open a great window for our teachers and students in India. So uh, once again, I'm very thankful to, uh, uh, to Professor Klaus for just giving this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are just very eager to, to listen to you, sir. And I congratulate Dr. Vasudev Gurunale for organizing such a wonderful program. Thanks to Dr. Bipul Saha for sharing this opportunity with SET. And SET will always be ready uh, to, to, to share many things. My UPSC and SET are doing uh, many programs in India. So once again, I just uh, congratulate uh, all the participants. And I, I welcome Professor Klaas uh, to speak on this occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Paris. Now, I welcome Professor Hemant Pandey, Vice President, ACD West Zone, for introducing our esteemed speaker for the day, Professor Klaus from West. Dr. Pandey is an ex-professor, Department of Chemistry, Islam College, Nagpur. I welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, my proud privilege to introduce Professor Klaus Kumare, who is a global stalwart in sustainable chemistry. The word sustainable chemistry was written unknown a few years before. But my teacher used to say that whatever we do in the test tube, we just throw in the sink and we never bothered about what is the harm which will be created to the environment. But anyway, Professor Klaus is the director of an institute of sustainable and environmental chemistry and holds the chair of sustainable chemistry and material resources at the public Luhana University, Lundberg in Germany. He is also director, researcher, and education and education of the. He is also director of research and education of the International Sustainable Chemistry Collaborative Center, ISC3 in Bonn, in Germany. His research and teaching is focused on sustainable chemistry, sustainable pharmacy, material resources, aquatic environmental chemistry, and in environmental and sustainable research. So much widely spread field. He has received national and international awards for his interdisciplinary work. Professor Claus serves and served in national committees, many national committees, example, German Research Council, Senate Commission for Water Research, Board of Division of Sustainable Chemistry of German Chemical Society, and international one, including Global Chemistry Chemical Outlook by UNEP and EU technology platform, so came Europe. IUPSC Interdivisional Committee on Green Chemistry for Sustainable Development. 
he is advising international organizations such as UNEP and WHO and companies. He is also a scientific chair and co-organizer of the annual interdisciplinary green and sustainable chemistry conferences and the annual summer school on sustainable chemistry in international cooperation. He is a founding editor and editor-in-chief of Sustainable Chemistry and Pharmacy and current opinion in Sustainable Chemistry journals as well as associate editor of Chemosphere and Environmental Pollution. He published extensively international scientific peer review journals and co-edited more than 10 scientific books which are available on the net. It's a wonderful kind of the work which uh, Professor Claus has done for the uh, sustainable chemistry, which is, I think, is the most important part of the chemistry education now. So I don't want to come in between. Let us uh, hear and uh, in, uh, let uh, the talk uh, by Professor Claus. Thank you very much. So I guess I should start now. Sir, I invite you to uh, start your talk. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Vandeep, and for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And thank you also uh, to Professor Parib, Prabhu, and uh, Granul, and especially Bipul, Bipul Saha, for inviting me, for creating this great opportunity to share some of my insights and thoughts and ideas uh, with all of you. And as I have heard, uh, so many participants. And so thank you again. And I'm very glad. I've been very happy to accept this invitation because sustainability is about the future. And the future starts with education. And sustainability also is heavily linked to chemistry because all the material world around us is chemistry. Yeah? And the nice products to support uh, us on our way to sustainability uh, it's chemistry, so chemistry is a central science this is in this context, and that means um, chemistry educators and teachers um, have a, a very important role here um, for the future, starting already today, because what we are doing today will have an impact on tomorrow. So dear colleagues and students, um, I hope that I can fulfill the high expectations and I will start to share my screen and then I will start the presentation. Yeah, um, I'd like to um, focus a little bit um, why we have green chemistry and why it's important, but also why uh, there are limitations we have to overcome. And uh, these days, especially in Europe, I, I guess all over the world, but in Europe, we have already a political agenda for this uh, circular economy. And also that it's important to understand how chemistry can contribute, how chemistry has to fit into a circular economy to make it feasible. And again, there are certain limitations um, and therefore uh, there is a need for broader, for even broader framework and that's chemistry for sustainability or in brief, sustainable chemistry. So as a student, normally you are not so aware how many chemicals um, are globally marketed. Uh, according to a, a study only published recently, um, it's about 350,000 chemicals uh, that are globally marketed. Uh, the data for Europe, for example, would be about 100,000 plus mixtures of them. And then we have materials. Often chemists do not think of materials, for example, electronic materials, or you learn a lot of, of plastics, but probably not so much what in practice it means. So we have many chemicals, many complex products. So it's a huge success story of chemistry. Uh, it started about 150 years ago, 
with the uh, discovery of the periodic table. At the same time, in Europe, the chemical industry started. And nowadays, it's real uh, indispensable everywhere. It's a global player, and it's so important for our health and for our uh, status of living and um, quality of life. This success story of chemical industries, to make it short, um, has also, um, how, say, how should I say, a downside or backside of this uh, metal. Um, estimates say that at least, and probably it's many more, of the 350,000 chemicals uh, used are of environmental relevance. And in addition, we have about 3,000 pharmaceuticals, active pharmaceutical in ingredients, most of them end up in the environment after excretion by patients. And in the environment and in technical processes, we also often have uh, follow-up products of incomplete degradation, which are not included in the number I, I, I give you here. In some cases, if, it's, if they are formed by reaction uh, with light, uh, one mother compound one parent compound could result in up to 10 follow-up products, which we most often do not even know what they are, how they behave, and how toxic they are. Even in Europe, data tell us hazardous to health are still 62% of chemicals in terms of volume. So you would assume Europe is uh, uh, widely uh, progressed, but you see even here we have still a lot of work to do which is now also addressed in a new strategy of the European Union uh, called uh, chemical sustainability, chemicals for sustainability and a non-toxic environment. If you type in this into the internet, you will find easily um, uh, the documents. Worldwide, according to World Health Organization, about 1.6 million deaths um, in the in 2016 are attributable to chemicals, death. So that's a very serious uh, um, uh, cases here. And many more are affected. What we are also seeing, um, it's not increasingly about acute intoxication. It's increasingly about long-term affecting people. So chronic intoxication, um, the latest one under discussion is impact on behavior. Neurological behavioral disorders caused by chemicals an estimation says by a, a United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, um, more than 170 billion US dollars per year are the costs related to this in the environment. If you would take a few from some of you uh, samples from your bloodstream, then we would be able to find to detect several hundred synthetic chemicals. So. This, these are things, uh, also environmental pollution by chemistry production, which is uh, in, in some countries still a huge issue, in others less because of effluent and exhaust treatment. Um, that was one of the reasons uh, um, to, to come up with green chemistry. And as already mentioned, John Warner and Paul Anastas uh, summarized this in the 12 principles you see here. Um, there have been a lot of discussions and precursors uh, beforehand. Uh, United, uh, uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency, but also in Europe already in 1996, there was a law with also 12 principles. Uh, some are the same, some are even going further, and that was already a regulation. But the great job uh, uh, Paul and John did, they summarized it very briefly in these 12 principles, also what other colleagues, scientists have contributed, and came up with a small booklet. And for a long time, it was not so uh, uh, perceived, but since about 10, 15 years, uh, it's well perceived, and as already mentioned, uh, it made its way into industries, but also in education. And green chemistry, you could summarize the 12 principles, is a focus on uh, synthesis and properties of chemicals you are synthesizing. And it's, it came mainly with a background from organic chemistry. And uh, there are the green processes also included. There's also now principles for green processing um, available. <clears throat> but in, in fact, it's about the chemicals reducing toxicity, uh, preventing waste, etc. Um, 
Just a few examples you probably know. Uh, renewable resources, you should use not, uh, you should not grow them directly, which is, by the way, not directly addressed uh, in, in the 12 principles, but we have learned in the meantime. Um, we should not compete with uh, space uh, or land uh, surface for growing resources for chemistry. We should use organic waste, agricultural waste, for example. Um, as you see here, a few examples. There are many more also in, in your country, I guess. Uh, there you can extract nice uh, um, chemicals, uh, starting with, with fatty acids, but also a lot of polyphenols, etc. just to mention a few. So it's important to go for the waste because the waste is there anyway. Again, maybe we cannot use all the way agricultural waste because some of the organic carbon and the molecules in there and also the mechanical properties of straw, of husks, for example, are needed for soil fertility. So that already shows you even renewable resources are not endless. Another uh, point is use renewable energy and renewable energy, in fact, all is solar energy, wind and, and water, everything is solar energy, in fact. And there are great opportunities, you know, direct for, for, the, for synthesis. Uh, you see down here, one of the cycler additions, which are well known uh, um, as, for, as for this. So, um, um, and just directly by light, uh, but also for the catalysis uh, is, is on uh, an important topic also for effluent treatment, but there already the problems start because if you treat effluent to destroy the pollutants in there, very often, so as already mentioned, these um, products of incomplete degradation, these unknown ones are formed. So again, we have to have a closer look on the nice ideas. Organic photovoltaics, very important technology for the future, and dye-sensitized solar cells, light-driven mechanisms, uh, are big opportunities to better understand and to apply in the future. And also in combination, photo and electrochemistry. And just an example below here, um, you see um, down here, uh, the chemistry will probably play a huge role to store energy because the renewable energies are not always available when you need them or produce because if it's night, for example, or there's no wind. So we need storage. Um, uh, devices. And chemistry, again, uh, has a, a great contribution uh, to bring in here. Then uh, carbon dioxide as a resource is under discussion um, to come up, as you can hear, see here, using carbon di dioxide and um, renewable energy from light, most often it's electricity. So uh, by direct chemistry or by using photovoltaics and electrolysis, um, to come up with liquid fuels. So first step would be to synthesize methane, and then you can go on uh, to get uh, other valuable products from the monomers to the polymers. Um, and uh, the methane, for example, could also be used to store energy. Um, hydrogen can be produced. There's research going on uh, to synthesize ammonia um, using hydrogen directly. Um, and uh, electrochem electrochemically, and um, that would be have a big advantage because ammonia, uh, um, the Harbour Bosch process, uh, is responsible for about three to five percent of world's energy demand. But it's, it's central for agriculture and, and nourishing humankind. So that looks all very good, but as a chemist, you know that it's not by chance that carbon dioxide is the uh, uh, final product of each incineration, because the energy content of carbon dioxide is very low. And that means by this synthesis, we have to put in all this energy again. And then we also need more because uh, we have to activate it. So we have activation energy by catalysis. We can save some of them, but it's clear for thermodynamical reasons all the energy which is already in, in fossil resources, we have to bring in within short time into carbon dioxide. So albeit it might be an interesting approach in some cases, um, I'm not sure whether we will have all the energy we need to produce all the fuels, 
all the carbon building blocks of the future. Other opportunities in the future, probably more and more synthesis will be done, uh, not in big vessels, 5,000 liters or even more, um, probably, and that's already done in some industries, um, you will do it in microflow, flow chemistry or microflow chemistry, which allows you to be uh, much more flexible. There is no need to store uh, several uh, um, hundred kilograms of raw material or to deal with 5,000 liter of solvent. Um, you do it on the, on the scale of, let's say, 50 or 100 milliliters in a minute. In a minute. So that's uh, there are less safety issue. There is less waste. Yeah, because the uh, reaction can be steered much better. And you can, in contrast to the principles of 12, uh, 12 principles of green chemistry, you can deal with hazardous reactants because you can generate them in situ. And they are, gener they are formed and at the same moment they are reacting. And you have a lot of more flexibility because uh, you can easily stop and you can then start with a new synthesis uh, within short time. Uh, so you can much better adapt to the needs of the customers. And that's also possible in combination with electrochemistry and photochemistry. And I think, especially for developing countries, um, uh, uh, that's a, a huge opportunity if there is no big chemical industry already there. Because normally you cannot start as a chemist with a startup uh, as you can do in, in software business as you do normally would need much more money, uh, millions uh, of euros or dollars. But in this case, you can start small scale. Important to mention uh, also as for green chemistry, in fact, we should talk about greener synthesis and greener processes or chemistry for greener synthesis, because we do not know in an absolute sense what is green. We can only learn and assess by comparison to pro processes, to products, uh, given criteria. Some of them are the 12 principles, and then we have to come up with metrics, uh, for example, kilogram per waste, uh, kilogram waste per kilogram of product, the E factor, which was introduced by um, Robert Shelton um, at Delft University already more than 20 years ago. And we also have to be aware, green chemistry is a normative framework. It's a human value proposition that we say greener is better. Nature cannot tell us and does not tell us uh, what is better or what is greener. For nature, there are molecules. Some have an effect. Okay, they have an effect. Yeah, maybe they will kill organisms, but okay, the organisms are killed, then maybe other will, will have an evolution uh, and take the, overtake this niche. That's very important to understand. So it's our goals, our aim. And this, on the one hand, is maybe a limitation, but on the other hand, it shows the opportunities we have. So when you are leaving the lab latest uh, with your products and your knowledge, um, you are leaving the, the, the realm of science because the science, chemistry as a science, not as a chemical sector, and we have to be aware, if you talk about chemistry, it's always or often both science this science is non-normative. The atoms, the molecules, they do what they do according to their nature um, under, under given conditions. So that's independent of human value proposition. Only if we use it for a certain purpose, then um, and try to do better. Uh, and uh, then we are here in the normative framework and your human value proposition. That's very important to understand. Because it underlines it's us when going for products uh, who is responsible. And it's us who could do better. We cannot say, oh, that's chemistry. We cannot change. We can. We can change uh, the chemistry in terms of what we are uh, uh, um, uh, synthesizing, how we are synthesizing, and the applications. Let's have a uh, a few on the future or the trends we see with chemistry. So there will be an increase of volume of chemicals sold. Data here from OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, here is a sales volume and what's expected. Um, so we will have a fourfold increase 
until 2050 since 2010. Yeah, all doubling also here. So that's sales volume, but that for sure translates also to tonnage. So there will be a huge increase. Also, the good part of it, because we hopefully have some development uh, in Africa, in Asian countries, South America, um, to increase standard of living. And therefore, we would need probably more products of chemistry. But that relates also to the increase in use of resources. As you can see here, the OECD countries um, uh, um, they have already quite well established chemical industries. But even there, you have an increase in most cases of uh, typical resources. Then we, here we have bricks, for example, Brazil or China uh, um, and so on. Uh, more increased and so-called rest of the world, which is the most important uh, uh, part of the world, if you think of number of inhabitants and um, yeah, all parts or all people are important, in my understanding because ethics is an important point. And by the way, I will <clears throat> tell you later, that's also part of sustainable chemistry, if you are a chemist. And you see here, the increase is even bigger. And it's not only about volume, it's also about diversity. In analogy to biodiversity, we could say uh, there is a chemodiversity. So what you are expecting, you see here, the number of chemicals registered in the chemical abstracts uh, database is steeply increasing. Sure, not all of these molecules will make it to the market, but if we have more available and registered, uh, uh, and it's more or less the same percentage, then the diversity on the market will also increase. And the same holds for the metals. Yeah, we are living now in all metals age, you could say. We are using the complete table uh, of periodic system elements, um, apart the radioactive ones, some we do, but most of them we do not, but all the others we are using, interestingly also for new technologies. So new technologies is also a driver uh, for this increased uh, diversity. And uh, increased diversity, I will show you later, comes with several problems and challenges. And we have this trend of increasing complex products uh, just a few examples. You see here a, a soccer shirt. Um, it's not just one fiber, uh, the polyester or the polyethylene terephthalate. Uh, here, for example, very often you have a mix with cotton. Um, you have elastane, which is an elastic fiber. Also, you have polyurethane here uh, and here, for example. And you have the dye or the dyes, many dyes. Um, in fact, um, there are more than 6, 600 chemicals for textile manufacturing on the market, which relates to nearly 10,000 different products for textile chemistry. Many of these chemicals stay on the textile after it's finished. Some not, some are only used for processing of the fiber, but many stay on the, on the, uh, um, on the textile, on the shirt, for example. So they are going to the consumer. Another example, the polymers, the plastics. So, you know, we have a, a homopolymers, so the building blocks are the same, yeah, the, the monomers used, but we also have block copolymers. So we have already two different building blocks here. We have uh, then statistically uh, once, and then we have polymers with even more than three uh, building blocks here, for example, a tree block, copolymer, uh, and even more. Uh, we have polymers with functional groups. And that's not yet the end of the story. Very often you have additives in there. So we have a mixture in, uh, uh, in, in molecules. On the, on, on, on the molecule level already we have mixtures. There are fillers, there are plasticizers, maybe you know PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which is normally a very hard a material at room temperature. Up to 60% could be plasticizers. Some of them have endocrine, endocrine activity. They are toxic to humans and the environment um, to, to make it more soft. We have colorants, we have flame retardants. Many of the flame retardants are so-called POPs, persistent organic pollutants. They persist in the environment. Often they are also uh, toxic neurotoxicity, um, endocrine activity, 
they sneak out from the products and we can measure them globally all over the world. Yeah, we have antioxidants, thermal stabilizers, UV screen, antistatics, for example, um, in flooring, um, anti-reflection, white not to mention just a few. Here we have a nice graph. That's a wrapping uh, um, of foliage used to store food. And as you can see, it's not just polyethylene. Yeah, one of the, of the layers is polyethylene, another is a polyethylene terephthalate, and there are many others. In total, it's about seven adhesives, and all of these contain also additives. And here you can see the increase also in world production. We have two types of plastics. We have the duroplastics or thermosets. They cannot be, uh, if, if you heat them up, they will not soften, they will just start to be destroyed of, uh, above a certain temperature. Thermoplastics are getting softer with increased temperature. So these we can maybe reuse and remold. In other words, these you cannot recycle. Only if you depolymerize them, which again needs a lot of energy and needs a lot, uh, um, creates a lot of waste. Another trend um, that's also why we can meet today so many people at different places. Uh, we have communication digitalization. Uh, we have digitalization in industry um, as a future trend. Uh, we have in some countries the so-called smart home. To be honest, I, do, I have no idea why I, sh I should have a home where everything uh, I can uh, uh, steer, for example, with my uh, mobile from uh, another place. If I'm there, I will do it. If I'm not there, it's fine. Has worked for centuries, for yeah, millennia it has worked. Why now coming up with a lot of this electronic material, which is a huge mixture on an atomic level and a molecular level. And I come back to this later. So electronification, as I call it, is everywhere. It's a, it's a huge trend. Has a lot of advantages, but as Always, there's always there's also a price we have to pay. So let's have a closer look into your smartphone. Complex product, the smartphone here. So we have more than 40 elements in there, plus compounds, plus small organic molecules. As you can see here, flame retardants again. We have polymers, we have ceramics, all mixed on a molecular level. Some of them you see, for example, palladium, only 14 milligrams in there. So these in blue, they are most often recycled, if at all. The others are most often lost. Lost means as elements, they are not gone away in terms of they are not there anymore, but they are part of the waste in low concentrations and uh, probably nobody will, will extract them. Chemically, it would be feasible. Yeah, uh, metallurgy could do this. And that's already an example why just doing good chemistry is not enough. We have to, we need a broader thinking. Another trend, modern cars. Um, you see lots of plastics of polymers in there and additives also, and it's different ones, different places. And some of them are used because to save weight, to save fuel, which is a good idea. But in fact, nobody knows how to recycle most of these uh, plastics and how to get them back. In other words, we are postponing a problem into the future. And the car nowadays with the terms and with a few uh, by electronics, as you can see here, you could say it's, a, it's a, a, um, a rolling computer, computer on wheels. As you see all here, we have electronics involved. And, then, and uh, there's about one to two kilograms neodymium, a rare earth metal in there, for example, and many others. Or if it's an electric car with an electromotor, uh, then it's about 25 kilograms of copper. Will we ever be able to get hold on so much copper and metals? And it comes along with a lot of mining uh, energy and pollution, uh, but also a lot of energy and waste until we have the high grade metals. This, I think, is well known in the meantime, uh, in the media, macroplastic, but be informed, it's not just microplastic. The microplastic um, uh, is what you see here. Most of them, two thirds is assumed is not on the surface of the water. It's already 
on the, on the ground of the oceans, the floor there. And there are microplastics, uh, plastics, microplastics uh, from products, uh, but also abrasion uh, from tires, from facades, for example. And this type of plastics you see here on the left side um, is also by mechanical forces um, broken down into small pieces. So animals uh, um, are starving here because if they uh, feed on it, they have the feeling my stomach is full, I'm saturated. So they are starving because they do not take up any food. And here, in this case, the situation is a different one. Um, organic pollutants present in the water, for example, uh, the, the flame retardants, plasticizers, and many others, they are nicely sorbing to these tiny particles. So they, they are accumulating pollutants and these are taken up then by the animals and they are intoxicated. And some of these also then come back um, via the food web to us. So it's not just about the environment. And we, we are wise to be aware that we are not separated from the environment. We are part of the environment. Textiles, uh, um, India is a big producer, but India also, uh, and Pakistan, for example, other countries, Bangladesh, and we have a lot of issues that uh, most of the textiles are worn not uh, very long. I will not talk about the conditions, how they are pro produced. So there are a lot of issues from workplace safety, from uh, uh, loans, uh, etc. But also uh, outdated or old textiles are uh, not recycled. They are just dumped in, in such sites like here. And all the chemicals, there are estimates um, that about 95, up to 95% in some cases, most often 80% of the chemicals used in production are still on the fibers. And by time, they are washed out here. So they are uh, intruding uh, the groundwater, which is a very important uh, resource of drinking water. So you see here already how to deal with such a complex product, a complex waste. Yes, you can say, let's separate, but that needs a lot of energy and needs a lot of organizational affairs. It can be done and has to be done, but we have to be aware of. Electronic waste, often from the so-called developed countries like mine, and I underline so-called because we also have to develop in a better direction. Uh, outdated computers, uh, smartphones, etc., are exported uh, in, into other countries and poor people have to make a living by incinerating, using the plastic as fuels um, to get out some of the metals I already mentioned. So the people are intoxicated, the soil is intoxicated, the atmosphere, the water. It's a mess, it's a horrible mess. And these pictures are from a place which, which is called, which is really called Sodom in Ghana. And there's a nice uh, um, uh, um, documentation on the internet available by a group um, of, from Austria. Have a look on, that's the best here. Your smartphone is already there. Try to get hold on your old smartphone and then you will see. E-waste uh, in the year 2019, we had about 50 million tons per year. That relates to about the weight of 5,000 Eiffel Towers uh, per year or seven kilogram per inhabitant. And if you are in a, in a living in a, uh, under conditions, where, where you have good conditions, then you probably would say, yes, I have a mobile, I have a computer, but uh, maybe I use it, hopefully, longer than a year. Um, so I do not use seven kilograms per, uh, per year. But if you think of all the electronification, communication, um, industrial processes behind, uh, or if you think of your workplace, um, and there's, of, there's also lots of electronics, and that's because of your activities, because of your uh, living standard, etc., And some companies uh, selling you uh, uh, um, a contract uh, for the internet, they announce each year a new phone. How crazy is that? That's just selling our common future. And normally people think, yeah, but I need a new one. But often it's not need, it's want, because maybe it's more fancy, it looks more modern, but in fact, if you're honest to yourself, you are using only a few functions. And so then there's an update of software in your computer or uh, in your mobile phone. And you think I need it because 
that will accelerate the things. There are new uh, apps available, but again, many of the apps you don't uh, use. And the Swiss colleague has nicely shown that the new software and the new model often is uh, slower than the old one because it needs more data to handle, etc. So that's not even a real progress. It's maybe probably just about our humans uh, strange self-understanding to define ourselves uh, by what we have and not what we are. Yeah, as already mentioned, also there is a huge increase in resources and resources are running short, both in quality and in quantity. In quality, because the low-hanging fruits are already harvested. And quantity also because accessibility um, is more challenging. And therefore, I like this uh, uh, picture here, this photograph, this copper mine um, in Arizona, United States. We really, we virtually have to dig deeper to get hold on the resources we need or we want to have. And that means, on the other hand, we need also more energy, higher costs. I mentioned already resources, bioresources are also not endless. There's competitive use, uh, there's a, a shortage, uh, or this planet has a, a, a finite surface, it's not endless, etc. And if you go to the fossil oil, for example, on a bigger time scale, you see it's only a blink in, in the planet's history. It helped us a lot to, to go where we are with all our knowledge and science and industrial production. Um, that's, that's true, but it will come to an end. And as for water, the pollution is increasing globally. And that will be exacerbated by the climate change. And unfortunately, most probably in the country that are countries that are the most arid ones and the most populated ones. So we have to think about more water reuse, but for water reuse, we need clean water. If we have to, to clean it up before, um, if it's possible at all, and we know that not all, even if there's a sewage treatment plant uh, there, not all of the pollutants are removed. Some are still there. And if you have a so-called advanced treatment by photocatalysis or oxidation by ozone, uh, it's even worse because then again, these unknown follow-up products are formed. So again, it's more a masking thing. We have to learn, we have to go back to the source to prevent problems. So first of all, we need a broader framework than just green chemistry or chemistry for greener products. This broader normative framework is chemistry for circular economy. So here also the products now come into view. It's not just the chemicals, it's also the technical products, the complex products beyond uh, the molecules. That's what we find in the market. The chemical industry produces a lot of things they do not buy themselves using. They sell it and downstream industry is using them, most of them, more than 90%. So we have to include the downstream industry and chemists have also talked to them more to understand what are their needs and how, it could, how they could help them. And what you can also see, not everything which is greener fits into a circular economy. And as already mentioned, as for the 12 principles, when do we call a product greener? If only one principle is fulfilled, yeah, I get a, as an editor I, of a journal, I get a lot, uh, I receive a lot of manuscript calling something green or greener or even sustainable, but it's just one principle has been addressed. That could not be the future. And the same holds for circularity. Think about when you uh, call something, yes, that contributes to circular economy. You have to prove it and you have to address it. You have to demonstrate. Important for a good role of chemistry and their products in the circular economy is first think about design on a molecular level, but also on a level of complex products. Textiles, you have to talk to the designer of the textiles because they often do not know of the problems. They often think, oh, there's a nice product, a nice fiber, a nice chemical, I will use it. And that's how it's sold. No, that's not the future anymore. You have to sell the advantage, you have to talk about the advantages, but also the disadvantages. And then you start talking to each other. 
and then probably you can come up even with new and better ideas. So it's not just about doing nothing or less, it's just about doing different with new opportunities also for business. So the design, then you can do the synthesis. Um, and then first of all, products should be designed that they could, could be shared. Um, and then that they are easy to repair and not that if something in a part or a building block is broken, you have to throw away the whole thing. So the future understanding is, wow, this guy has a, a phone that is already 10 years old. Looks fancy, I want to have it. And not the latest one. The same is for reuse. That means, for example, building blocks um, of, of a product, um, maybe uh, of your mobile, the battery or something else, the electronics can be used for other purpose. So, but you need to be able to dismantle it. And then you can go for remanufacture on a, a, mod, uh, on a molecular level or atomic level, metallurgy um, also, but uh, 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 for um, depolymerization of plastics, but that's already uh, related to a lot of energy need, a lot of waste uh, used. So that's not the first option, that's the last option. For thermoplastics, maybe you should first think about to remold it. So the bottle becomes this box, for example. So we have to think very early to the end of life already, before we start even doing synthesis, we have to think of use, what's the future market anticipated and what will be the end of life? Will it end up in waste or in the water? And this we have to take into uh, uh, account here when we are starting to design something. And we also, as you are all chemists, so I think I can uh, use this here, uh, there are entropic losses. Uh, for example, you have a metal uh, in the catalytic converter of your car to reduce uh, the, the, uh, the pollutants there uh, to, um, to degrade it, but the, there you need platinum or rhodium, um, but these are also uh, emitted and they are just then along the roadside in very low concentration. So you will never be able to get them back, maybe for technical reasons and for economical reasons. We have to learn about this and take this into consideration. Only then um, we, we are on a, on a good way. Yeah, we have, uh, uh, me and some colleagues, we, we uh, thought a little bit about this. So uh, what could be important points to better, to be better able to integrate chemistry in the circular economy. I will not go into details, but you see here, be responsible. So that's not what, what is in, within normal chemistry. It's also not within green chemistry. Yeah, I, I reduce and simplify diversity and dynamics of products, but also the related material and substance flows, etc. I think this publication is open access, so you can easily uh, read. But even if we have a well working uh, uh, products for circular economy, there is a broader picture we have to be aware. Of. So we first of all, we have to collect the items we want to to uh, um, uh, to recycle. So in Germany, for example, we were very good in in waste paper collection and to come up with recycled paper. Uh, there we have about 60%. On the other hand, even in Germany, outdated phones. Uh, smartphones, it's less than 1%. We do not know why. A lot of people have two or three old, outdated, or let's better say, not in use anymore because they are still working, they are still functioning. And mobile phones in the drawer somewhere at home. Maybe for uh, memor memories or thinking, maybe someday I could need it again. At the same time, we are thinking about uh, buying a new one. So let's say on average 30%, which is by far not in each case a good uh, a high number uh, uh, a very high number but in many of uh, many cases it's probably less this assembling that's quite good for example uh, if you do just crashing your computers yeah? and then the pre-processing um, and if you go for metals then the metallurgy here 95 percent this we know very nicely very good how to do very well established technical processes but in the end you have to multiply all these rates and you come up with just 20% and even quite optimistic data. But we are optimistic, so we think 
we can improve even more. So let's assume each of these is more or less perfect. Even then you will lose about a fifth. You will never get hold on it on the different levels. So only 80% of the metals, for example, you then will get back. Or the fibers. And then there are lots of products, molecules that cannot be circulated. Think of pharmaceuticals, they are excreted into water and many of them are not removed in sewage treatment plants. If there is a sewage treatment plant, 80% of world's effluents are not treated according to data uh, from U United Nations Environmental Program, water. That's part of our research, for example. We try to come up with products, with molecules. Here are some examples. Uh, here we have uh, pharmaceuticals, um, which are mineralized in the environment. They are not mineralized in the human body, but interestingly, that's not a contradiction. They can be applied, they are active, they are of low toxicity, so they compete with others used, and, um, but uh, they are nicely degrading in the environment, mineralizing, complete degradation without formation of uh, follow-up products. Or here, ionic liquids, an example, which are seen as green, but only because of low vapor pressure. For safety reasons, addressing just one of the green prints of the green chemistry principles. We were able together in a cooperation um, with people from Tallinn University uh, to come up with nicely environmentally uh, degrading and mineralizing uh, ionic liquids. So these are a little bit greener. But, and, and in this case, even we used, they used our partners uh, renewable resources for synthesis, that's a natural amino acid, and uh, then there's a longer chain, a fatty acid, so, but still not all of them of the principles are met. Here we have a new antibiotic, which then if it's nicely degradable in the environment, also contributes to fight antibiotic resistance, which is a huge global problem. So an, an interim summary, I would say, be aware there is no endless circuit circulating and no endless recycling. There are unavoidable losses in terms of quantity and quality. And if you want to circulate something, we first of all have to avoid pollutants or toxic compounds in the products because they may accumulate in the circle. And there's a need of energy. There's an increase of entropy. That means, yes, we can come up with a higher grade copper after circulation and recycling. But we will also come up with a lot of slack of very low quality, lower quality. So if we have a system thinking, then we see, and as chemists, you have learned thermodynamics, then you know there is no escape of creating energy, of creating uh, entropy, increasing entropy. And as already shown, not all chemicals and products can be circulated. Holds also, for example, for the toothpaste and the ingredients or the shampoo, uh, the cosmetics you have used today. So a summary here could also be, uh, if you're a little bit familiar with physical chemistry, thermodynamics, I know it's challenging, but maybe for your students, it's easier to understand if you just choose different words. So if you are a soccer player uh, um, or uh, tennis or whatsoever, um, I'm just uh, thinking about what the most famous game in India is. Um, you cannot win. You can only end up in a draw. That tells thermodynamics. There is no machine uh, that just produces more energy than it needs. And the same uh, uh, second law is you can only up in a draw at perfect conditions. You have learned absolute zero in terms of temperature. There is a perfect crystal, then it's perfect. Entropy is zero. And that holds for all what we are doing on this planet. We teach. Thermodynamics, yeah, for the lab, uh, for the for the university, but it's the same all in our life, even beyond chemistry and materia. You always have to invest uh, to keep your desk and your car clean. You have to invest energy, and sometimes you lose something uh, as for friendship. So to keep structures uh, alive and, and and updated, you have to invest, and and you will always lose something because you will never reach perfect conditions. The world and chemistry is not perfect. 
or summarizing, we cannot win. We can only try to lose as little as possible under given conditions. So we have to think about what we are doing and the conditions we are setting. So what is needed is system thinking. So that's the last part of my presentation. The broader framework then, that's sustainable chemistry or chemistry for sustainability. Again, a normative framework, a human value proposition. And it starts to think about service. Why do we use chemicals? Benzene, this nicely aromatic compound and very interesting and amazing. I do not have it at home. Why not? Because it does not offer a function or service for me. And we have to, to here we have to start, think about what is needed. And then sometimes you can do without chemicals, but not without chemists, because chemists have an understanding what is the service a chemical can deliver and maybe uh, how it could be reduced. It's not, not always without chemicals, it's also sometimes with less chemicals, which translates to less resources and less waste and less energy or less environmental pollution. And things here you need also take into account the design, non-chemical design. The design of a product, I had just the example of textiles mentioned, determines what in there, what you need and what will go out into the environment and the type of waste you have and how you can treat and how much energy and money you have to invest. And also then you can have an alternative business model. You have to talk not only to your customer, you have to talk to all stakeholders along, and not only the value chain, you have to talk along the life cycle of a product because the value chains end where there is no value anymore. And that's often the so-called waste. So we need a broader thinking. Ethics is a point. It's not only about workplace conditions. Yeah, for example, if you think of cobalt, which is needed for batteries, uh, uh, for cars, but also your for mobile phone, there are only a few places where you can mine it. And one is in Africa. And uh, at one of these places, it's mined by child work, child labor, and it's used to finance a civil war. Do you want have su do you want such materials in your phone? Me not. So what is sustainable chemistry? Also important. It's a broad approach. It's a guiding principle. It gives direction, and probably we will never be perfect to be sustainable in chemistry. But it tells us we can always improve. That's the important point of a guiding principle. Probably you will never reach it, but you have to try, and there are a lot of opportunities to approach it, to come as close as possible. So it's not a state. It has dynamics. And it's not just normal principles. You meet or meet not. And it's by far not just optimization of individual chemical products. Instead, as already mentioned, you have to think about to improve functionality and service within a system where a chemical might may play a role or chemical knowledge. So it's not a new discipline. Instead, um, it's, it needs knowledge across all sub-disciplines of chemistry and beyond chemistry. I think I could uh, uh, make this clear already. The application is important. And I will give you a few examples because um, I think that sounds a little bit strange. And maybe it's strange, but it's part of the new future. And we are not yet accustomed to it. And therefore, it might uh, look a little bit strange. So starting with service and function, first, think about other alternatives. The alternative technology, if the alternative construction or design or information, and training and ed education is very important here. That's, I would say, central. That's key. Because if you have not a good education, then you cannot cope with the alternatives and see them. A simple example diff for different technology. No metal stables needed anymore. Instead, punched paper from the sheets are used to keep the, the, the sheets together. And it has even more advantages. It's much easier to untie. No special tool needed for this. No injuries if you do it without a tool. 
no metal wasted. And that again means no resources wasted, no metal lost, no energy needed. So that's a quite simple example. In many countries, we have highly packaged food to keep it there for several days. Why keeping food for several days? If you use it uh, uh, on a local or regional basis, then that's not needed. Here, that's, that's the material I have shown you with the complex plastics here, where you can, where you can see the food. So there are uh, uh, additives in there. And by the way, there is also nitrogen in. How crazy is that? Lots of energy just wasted. Why not doing this? And we see even in our country coming back to the good old things, more and more uh, public markets where you can shop directly are reopened. Or even in the supermarket, you can buy how much you want. One, two, three, four, five. No need to go for... Uh, let's say if there are six in very often or here or very often and you need only two. Yeah? Again, there are advantages, not only in terms of chemistry, waste and material. If, let's have a look on cosmetics, for example, uh, or here on the left side, hair conditioners. We are working on making silicones biodegradable in the environment. When we started this research, um, all the companies told us that's not possible. We cannot leave this out. Nowadays, if I enter a drugstore in Germany and increasingly also in other countries, they are advertising no silicones, silicone free. So obviously it was not necessary. The interesting question is, is there another compound which has, is now in and what are the properties or is it completely without? Or here, uh, 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 anti-transparent, yeah. no alcohol. Years ago, there it was only available with alcohol as a as a, a, a solvent. No aluminium salts in there. Yeah, they are discussed to contribute to Alzheimer's disease. Years ago, we have been told not possible with food. No artificial flavor, synthetic colors or preservatives. So we are coming back to the to the real good taste of nature here. And here, these examples to do the same service with less, also for companies has uh, lots of advantages because there is no need for you to buy silicones or uh, um, to, um, to synthesize them from other resources. So you are getting a little bit more independent from the resource side. And if you sell the product for the same price, you make even more money with less. Now that's important to see that there are also lots of opportunities. And I know in companies, there are the sales manager, they say, we have to make more money. We have to come up with new products. Yes, but maybe with more simpler and more wise products. It's easy to mix things. But if you have mixed something, again, thermodynamics, you know, you have to invest a lot of energy for separation. Mixing is going by its own separation not. Another example from our country here, um, we are going to, to insulate uh, our houses to save energy in the winter for the heating. So there is, a, there is plastics or polymers like polystyrene or polyurethanes um, and the facade. And the result is the surface, the average surface temperature um, uh, is going down throughout the year. That means we have more condensation, more often condensation of water. So we have humidity, we have light, we have organic compounds. So algae start to grow and fungi. So the reaction was, so let's put in a nice chemical product, the biocide, an algae side or fungi side. In the meantime, sorry, in the meantime, we could detect these compounds in groundwater. In, a, in an area where people said, oh, we had, we had a new fancy building which meets the demands uh, of, uh, to combat climate change. In fact, again, we have just uh, moved a problem from the atmosphere, from the facade to the water. And there is nothing new to invent. That's the, in all cultures, for a long time, 
the knowledge is available and also applied nowadays. Just go for reduced or no excess of water. Have a wise design, a wise construction. And at least then you need by far less. But therefore you have to talk to the investors, to the craftsmen and architects. So sustainability moving forward is an inter and transdisciplinary issue. Chemistry is very important, but it's not enough. We have to go beyond as chemists. As other subjects has also and professions have also to do. Another example, usage of antibiotics in Europe. So the use patterns of the countries, DDD, that's a, unit, a, a standardized unit, the failed tiny dosage per thousand people and here per year, per thousand population. So the Netherlands need only third or consume only third compared to Greece. And that's not because the Greek are more, much more often infected by bacteria. It's a question of culture and education, training of medical doctors and pharmacists. But it's not about blaming uh, the Greek here. Um, if you go uh, into the veterinary part, then it's the Netherlands, the Dutch, who use most per kilogram meat produced. So lots of opportunities to do better with less without, without losing standards and quality of life. Even in this case with antibiotics, if you use less, you will reduce the probability to select um, uh, resistant bacteria, which is important because if there are many resistant uh, um, kinds of bacteria, probably in the future, you will, uh, a treatment by antibiotics will not help anymore. It's a global issue. Now it's important to see it's not just doing less and, and we have to suffer. No, it opens up new opportunities and better situations. As for chemicals, you, are you need a solvent, but what you are interested in is in fact that your compound is dissolved. You are not really interested in solvent as a product. You want to have the service. And there's already, I think since, since 20 years, uh, a subsidy of Dow a company called SafeChem, there you pay for using the solvent. Not, you are not paying for tonnage or kilograms, you are paying for service. And that changes the situation completely because uh, then both sides have the interest to cooperate and to exchange because you are interested to pay as little as possible for the service uh, and the, the company um, uh, um, giving you the leasing the, the solvent to you has an interest to get back most of it and of highest quality. So you talk to each other how you can make the best for both sides. So that's a win-win situation and not a classical win-lose situation. One wants to, you know, one side wants to uh, uh, um, sell as much in terms of, of tonnage of products because that's the return on invest, of investment unit, but it's wrong. Um, and the other wants to pay as little as possible. So, and one of both is normally uh, the loser. And though you will not talk really to each other. And that's part of a new business model. Paying not per kilogram, but per functional unit. There are mother, many other examples. In a hospital, it's not about, um, so that is a project of ourselves, it's not about to use uh, as many uh, chemicals or disinfectants or kilograms as possible. It's about maintaining a certain hygiene standard. And if you have this view, then education comes into play. Then better construction to use less, this to need less disinfectant comes into your view. So here we had such a project, uh, it was a pilot project, and the host hospital learned there is no need for us to do this uh, not very welcome training in hygiene. Medical doctors are not really interested often in this. So they got rid of this because that was overtaken by the company uh, selling uh, the, the, um, the disinfectant. They then uh, handled the, the, um, the highly aggressive chemicals in there, the disinfectant. The, the hospital got rid of this uh, task where they were not really uh, uh, interested in and not really well educated. And the company noticed we can make money by sharing our knowledge when doing the education. And then they found out, wow, our sales fleet was great, but 
60% of the disinfectant they have sold was not needed. So they discovered when uh, um, doing this business model, in the end, uh, after the project was done, the colleague from the company told me, this, if we would apply this all over Germany for our customers, it would save us investment in a new facility for filling dis uh, uh, disinfectants. What a huge return of investment, an ines investment you don't have to do at all. Making money, at least in part, by knowledge, by giving advice for this, again, you need all the knowledge about the chemicals and their service and their function and why they are applied. So the broadest picture we have here, it's not just circular chemistry. We need uh, chemistry in a for a circular economy. There is no circular e chemistry, by the way. We can only circulate products, not chemistry itself. Um, we have to start with service and function. Then we can think about the design on a system level first to identify alternatives. And if we non-chemical based by behavior, by wise construction, et cetera, system design, you could say. And if chemicals are needed, chemical products, then you have to be aware of this part. So summarizing here, conventional green and sustainable chemistry, the old model is, or was hopefully soon, tonnage for value creation. It's a supply, a material driven model. The new model is about service. Service functionality and performance are important for value creation. It's demand driven. So the customer is not only the one who pays, he's the one who needs a service. And you have to, to talk and to work together to come up with good and sustainable solutions. And we had such projects and for me, it was really an enrichment. Maybe in the first hand you might think, oh, hi, as a chemist, should I talk to other people with the other background? Yes, you have to learn to understand each other, but that's part of the problem that we do not understand each other. So we are all well educated to solve problems. In the future, we have to better learn to avoid problem at the first hand, at the beginning of the pipe, as I call it. Just a, uh, uh, another word, that's the perception of nowadays. The economic system is the basis of all, but that's only the economic uh, liberalism. But we think that's it, and it's, it's given, we cannot change. And on this, uh, sociosphere is resting, and then we have a little bit of biosphere, yes, nice resources, and that's part of planet Earth. The basis is planet Earth, and the biosphere is resting on it, on it, on this one, social sphere, and then the economic system. That's the true picture. And this we have to respect. And then we will be successful to really that chemistry contributes in a sustainable manner to sustainability. Now it's not just that chemistry, what lots of companies are now saying, yes, chemistry will contribute to SDGs, new markets. That's right. But you have to do it in a sustainable manner not just with new products, a new uh, uh, additional use of resources and energy. This we have to learn. And in nearly all of these uh, uh, sustainable developed goals of the United Nations, the SDGs, um, chemistry is involved. So we have a huge task here, huge responsibility, but also a lot of opportunities. So I'm, I'm starting these days to get a little bit to envying uh, the younger ones because they have such a bright future in terms of opportunities and to make things better. I was asked to uh, uh, spend a few words on Lüneburg, Leuphana, what we are doing there. So first of all, Leuphana is not a very typical German university because we have a mixture between the old German, good old German diploma system and uh, the good old British American system. Um, so we have a, a college, for example, we have a professional school and so on. First of all, Leuphana understands itself as a university for freedom and responsibility. That means, yes, we want to educate very good scientists and, and, and do good science and educate at the highest level. And important here is that's not all. We also want to educate our students 
as, a, as humanists, thinking about humans, understanding humans, and thinking about also societal issue. Sustain, a sustainable university, not only in our buildings and what we are doing, also in the thinking. And the entrepreneurial university, we received several awards and we are one of the top uh, national entrepreneurial university. To, to pave the way, to help the young people with taking new opportunities, new ideas, which they develop already during their studies to come up uh, with new solutions uh, um, for sustainability. So where is Lüneburg? That's Europe maybe, you know, from the map. Um, here we have Germany. Here is Lüneburg in the very north. Maybe, you know, Hamburg, one of the most famous and biggest cities uh, in, in Germany. So Lüneburg is about half an hour by train south of Hamburg. And Lüneburg is an old Hanse city. Hanse was a, a guild of merchants uh, in the medieval ages. And Lüneburg get very rich at this time because of chemistry. They sold water. Uh, salt uh, to the others. Salt was needed for the preservation of food when they shipped the when uh, merchants from Hamburg or Lübeck here, they shipped the food to UK uh, to to uh, Brittany or they shipped it uh, along the, the the Baltic Sea, etc., or overland uh, deep into Russia. And you see here uh, the river and uh, historical boat where how they did this. Uh, Leuphana itself, um, we are, uh, as already mentioned, oriented on sustainability and innovation, and we are interested in issues instead subjects. Yeah, so we have four scientific initiatives, that's economy, education, cultural studies, and sustainability, where I belong to. Now you may ask, and where is the chemistry? The chemistry is within the faculty of sustainability, for teaching here, for example, uh, we have and also research, we have specific type sustainability programs on all academic levels. We see sustainability as a gross cutting topic. So we have a Bachelor of Environmental Science, which includes humanities and uh, science, natural science. And then there are specialization options, uh, also including uh, modules from other courses students can choose. Um, we have collaborative programs with uh, other international partner universities. So the faculty, faculty of Sustainability sees its task in education and um, also research um, to a sustainable transformation uh, of societies and economics. So we have an interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary uh, approach. On the one hand, we have the social basis of, si of society um, there ne you need to learn and to manage management, governance are important topics here of colleagues of mine. And we also at the same time have to think about the physical basis of society, physics in terms of energy, but also chemistry uh, and uh, biology, ecology. So here we have chemistry. There is no faculty, no department of chemistry. Teaching, for example, in the Master of Sustainability Science, um, it's interdisciplinary, so uh, students have to take uh, modules from the social ecological systems, thinking, um, inter other interdisciplinary ones, governance, law, social science, economics, and so on. A possible focus on this, they all have to do some chemistry, but then they can deepen and focus more. So there we teach the understanding of sustainable chemistry. Uh, what I have told you today could be a sort of introductory lecture for this. Uh, also addressing international regulations, international conventions, global ones, but also uh, chemical regulations on national or European level, uh, substance and material flow management, recycling, dissipation of metals, what it's all about, fate of chemicals and pharmaceuticals and environment, uh, basics of toxicology, um, then basics of computational chemistry to design new and better chemicals uh, and modeling and also the alternative business models. More of this you can read uh, in two uh, publications we just did this uh, year, uh, in Nature Reviews Chemistry and in uh, Green Chemistry. Interestingly, in these journals up to now, there was more or less no publications about education. But we wanted to have them, we talked to the editors and took some time, but the synthesis people have to be aware of this 
and the, the, uh, this graph from the Nature Reviews papers nicely demonstrates our understanding. It's about interaction. It's not only in the, in the lecture hall and in the practicals. You have to be aware of your complete physical and social um, uh, um, environment. Capacity building is important. Therefore, to be honest, I was never interested to waste time for uh, founding a journal. In the end, I did uh, with a very broad uh, uh, um, scope. The interdisciplinary uh, scope that I presented to you is reflected in this uh, uh, journal. It's nicely accepted uh, by readers in the meantime, but it's important that you do not just submit a technical paper or environmental chemistry paper. You have to address the greenness over sustainability issues you want to solve with your research. And there's also a, a review journal uh, as for the same. This is interested in brief and timely review articles, not 50, 100 pages, only 10 pages, more or less, uh, only a few uh, um, references, also well accepted. This we do, we did all to move sustainable and green chemistry and chemistry and circular economy forward to better understand it and to help it take ground. That is the, the basis of this, the same as uh, we have a green and sustainable chemistry conference, um, which is held annually. Again, it's not just about synthesis or resources. We also had a slot on education. Normally chemistry education is isolated. They have their own conferences. We have chemistry and economics. We have chemistry and ethics. We have next year a focus on Africa. Uh, maybe we should think about to have a regional focus also on India, where people from India or other countries can present what's going on in terms of sustainable chemistry in their region. We have to bring the together the different people. The same interdisciplinary approach, there's a summer school on sustainable chemistry for sustainable development, um, where in the first half, it's just a week. In the first half, we normally explain the concept uh, uh, of sustainable chemistry and also some international regulations and such things. And in the second part, we have uh, um, uh, practicals and, and, and seminars with a focus topic. Next one, next uh, this year in the summer will be sustainable chemistry and agriculture. Last year, it was sustainable chemistry and water. Before we had sustainable chemistry and electronics. There, for example, one of the uh, practical things you had to do was try to dismantle a, a, a mobile phone. So if you have uh, outdated the old one you do not need any more, use anymore at home, try to dismantle as if you were the recycler and you will see it's not feasible. And this again, it's not just for PhD students, these are the core group, but we have also master students and we have young professionals from industry, uh, from uh, authorities, uh, from universities, because they all have to interact. That's what we want this type of networking. And we have a professional master with, uh, which just started uh, for the second cohort um, uh, this week. And um, here the thing is, thinking is the same, but I did not want to wait until the young students make it into industries or authorities or governments on a level where, where they can take decisions. And therefore that's a, 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 a extra occupational uh, one, everything more or less is online, uh, only uh, three times for a week you are in Lüneburg, everything else is online, you can do what you, when you want, um, and um, that's nicely also taken up, just to move this uh, sustainable chemistry thing forward. Maybe a few words, because we are talking to educators and teachers, so the target group is international professionals with university degree in chemistry or related field, so you need a chemical background. Somehow, we have international teaching staff. Uh, it's not just us, from academia, from authorities, for example, UNEP uh, and, and WHO, industry, big industrial companies, um, metal recycler. The mode of study, as already mentioned, mostly online. Uh, there's a platform, Moodle, for remote learning. We use Zoom for live sessions and interactions and networking and three on-site sessions with practicals at Leuphane University. Here you see the, the, the modules, and there are two types, teaching of chemistry, so the basics of environmental chemistry, toxicology and ecotoxicology, 
computational chemistry, how to model properties and fate. And then green chemistry, we have a module and benign by design, that is how design in the future better products. For example, using also computational methods. And we have models teaching about chemistry. So the concepts of sustainable chemistry, as mentioned already, what I have shown uh, on the superficial level today, sustainable chemistry and renewable energy, resources and recycling and circular economy. If you want to know what is greener or more sustainable, we need metrics. So sustainable, uh, sustainability assessment is a topic, business models and strategy, law, international regulations and chemical management and society and responsibility that relates to ethics. And there are also small format certificates for benign by design or sustainable chemistry and regulatory affairs. So you, there you need only uh, four at maximum of, of these modules. And we are just uh, starting next year, uh, that's brand new homepage here, Master of Business Administration of Sustainable Chemistry Management, because it's not only the chemists uh, that, uh, govern, uh, poly that govern in politics, societies, and in companies. But these people also take decisions and they have to understand, not synthesis, but the general thinking advantages and needs of sustainable chemistry. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you so much for your long patience and your attention. Would be happy. Uh, I think there's still some time to take some questions. Oh, thank you, Dr. Klotz, for such an interesting uh, talk and for explaining things in such a simple manner so that everyone, I hope everyone have understood. And uh, the things you told were really thought provoking so that we can all indulge in green chemistry, thinking about sustainability. Thank you so much, sir. My now, pleasure. Uh, now the session is open for question and answers. If anybody has questions to ask, they can please uh, ask the question. Can they ask the, the lecture will be available, but uh, I would say a so-called clean version because some of the drafts um, I do not have own the copyright, uh, so I have to remove a little bit, but it will be more or less the same. We have agreed upon that it will be available later. Are they already there? Hello? Oh, yeah. Are they already there? Yes, yeah, yeah. Are they there? I have a question. I have a, I have a clarification regarding atmospheric uh, situation of ozone depletion. We have been talking about alternative refrigerant and also the damage by the UV radiation part of the solar radiation and the ozone holes that are being formed. And in this process, I not know much about the sustainability, probably to some extent conservability is talked about, and there's a whole lot of atmospheric reactions come into picture when we replace the refrigerant. And what is the current situation with the sustainability of the ozone depletion solution? Um, unfortunately, I did not understand clearly all of it because of the connection. Maybe someone else could quickly summarize and then I'd happy to answer. If you could please type your answer in the chat box. Uh, sorry, type the question in the chat box. I think that would be more clear to uh, Professor Claus. Yes, that would be very helpful. Type it briefly in the chat box. I, I just noticed that in the end it was about ozone depletion. And I think that's a nice example. If you bring together uh, uh, um, politicians and chemists and so on, uh, um, then you can come up with an international convention, which really helps. But also it's a nice example teaching us other things because the first publication on ozone depletion by, uh, by CFCs was already in the 1970s, in the early 1970s. And it took another 20 years until we had the Montreal uh, Protocol. Um, and uh, also another time scale these compounds need about 20 years arriving in the stratosphere. 
and they will be active there for about 100 years. So having back our atmosphere in terms of ozone hole, situation is improving, but having back in the status we had uh, in the 70s will take another 50 years at least. So we have to be aware of these time scales. And maybe that's already a nice example you, to be used for teaching. If you teach environmental chemistry, atmospheric chemistry, you can use this as an example. You can explain the chemistry, that's how I do it, but then also the political implications. Uh, I hope uh, sir, you have received the answer. I mean, I think the things were very clear as Professor Claus explained it very nicely. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes. yes, sir. Okay, okay. I got, I got clarification. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello. Uh, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. One question is there in the chat box. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir, you are audible. Uh, how sustainable chemistry plays a role in attaining these sustainable chemistry goals? Um, sustainable chemistry is playing a role everywhere you could say on each level it starts on the molecular and, and atomic and product level how to design products better with less resources less energy so we are starting here from from uh, green chemistry but again first think about which function is needed and maybe you come up with an alternative business model which contributes to to uh, to uh, maybe cleaner water yeah uh, to a specific uh, sdg or there are also um, these uh, sub-targets and, sub and, and have a look in and you can apply all what I have mentioned. Yeah? It depends on the situation. And then the next level uh, business, I mentioned already business models, teaching, teach your students about this framework that they know about, that they know on the challenges for chemistry, but also the opportunities. Try to go for system thinking. Or another example, when I teach, when I start teaching organic chemistry, I do not start with alkanes, alkenes, etc. I start, hey, look around, where is chemistry in this room? And then students think about and they discover, wow, everything is chemistry here. And then we can ask, where is organic chemistry here? And then I will not start uh, with alkanes, I will start who has manufactured, who has produced chemical industry. Then I will explain a little bit, also using economical data, the role of chemical industry. So chemistry as a sector. And then we start to think about and what are the resources? And then we are with mineral oil. And then we talk about peak oil. Yeah. And then later on, uh, we, we talk and discuss uh, about uh, uh, technical processes, how to get fuel. And that 90% or 85% of energy uh, of fossil fuels is energy which is used by chemical industry. And that we should save uh, the oil as a material. So that's, that's a part of this thinking. And if you teach this to your student, then they start to have a different thinking. They try to make connections with their everyday life and how to improve on the background of SDGs. So bring in the SDGs uh, and uh, helpful there is, for example, the Global Chemical Outlook, uh, the last version from 2020 of the United Nations. If you look, type into Internet Global Chemical Outlook 2, uh, then you will, you will get it. a lot of examples there describing the situation and how to improve. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Is the sustainable chemistry meant for the future? And uh, what is the response of the existing chemical industry to this demand of sustainable chemistry in their practices? Um, yeah, I think it, it is a demand. It's a huge demand for them because they also have to change their thinking. But there are already people uh, more and more in industry. They see, for example, we are facing a shortage uh, of resources. They see it because they are getting more expensive or they are sometimes not available. Yeah? Um, they see 
that um, the climate change is now uh, uh, more and more an important topic. They have made the experience that it's not enough to call something green and or sustainable because they have been blamed to do greenwashing and not having changed. Yeah? They see there could be new technologies like the microflow. Everybody could start. So uh, more and more they are start thinking about and asking us and others how we can do, and they come already up with some new ideas. The Dow can save metals uh, model for the solvent leasing that was already introduced 20 years ago, but there, it has to be promoted more. So there is not the industry, there are different industries, different people, that's also important. Many of them have children and their own. Yeah, when it was last year, I was in, uh, invited by a big uh, chemical industry to talk to the sustainability group. And they know that I'm quite critical. And I asked them, why did, why did you invite me? And they said, uh, the person said, because I have children and I do, I do not want them to play me in 30 years. Hey dad, what have you contributed? So it's on the different levels, and I think it's starting. It takes time, yeah, but it's starting, and therefore it's so important that we educate the young people in this direction. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your answer. Uh, any more questions? I think there is no more question. Okay. Uh, sir has given, explained very well. Yes. So now I would like to welcome Professor Vasudev Gurnele, second ACP West Zone for a formal vote of thanks. Professor Gurnele. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chau, madam. Uh, just now we have uh, completed here the today's uh, international webinar on sustainable chemistry and uh, organized by the Association of Chemistry Teachers, Mumbai. Uh, this has been very nice of all the guests to come over here and enhance the grace of the program. First, I would like to thank respected Professor Brijesh Parisa, President of Association of Chemistry Teachers, he always have been the source of inspiration for us and kind support in organizing such type of international webinar. I express my sincere gratitude to the respected Professor D.V. Prabhusar, General Secretary of ACT, who accepted our invitation and delivered a graceful speech on this occasion. We are have, uh, we all have been enlightened and motivated by your talk, sir. I also thanks to Dr. Bar and Dr. Bipul Bihari Saha, Director of Research and Development in NACL Industries Limited, Hyderabad, for guiding us from time to time to make this webinar a grand success. I am personally on behalf of an organizing committee uh, thankful to the our resource person, Honorable Professor Klaus Kumera. Sir is a director of the Institute of Sustainable and Environmental Chemistry and holds the chair of Sustainable Chemistry and Material Resources at the public Lupana University, Lisburg in Germany. 
sir has delivered an excellent talk and explained all the aspect related to the sustainable chemistry as a feature guiding principle so i am very thankful to professor kumar sir i express my thanks to dr hemant pandey vice president of sct waste zone professor rakhi gupta madam secretary of sct central zone executive council member of the sct life members of sct for their support to make this webinar a grand success on this occasion i also thanks professor ajiz hasan from the kuala lumpur malaysia joined for this online webinar i am also thankful to all the participant from different countries like bangladesh nigeria philippines pakistan oman iraq tunisia south arabia afghanistan libya algeria republic of korea south korea portugal ethiopia nepal poland malaysia indonesia jordan sri lanka canada and for giving a warm response for this international webinar at last i give thanks to all those who help us directly or indirectly to make this international webinar a grand success once again thank you to all one and all thank you madam thank you sir and i am uh, thankful to everyone for joining this very important <laughs> webinar and i'm sure we'll be meeting very soon with the next uh, nice presentation of our conference thank you everyone thank you so much thank you hello those are on the zoom uh, kindly thank you so much kindly uh, on your camera so that we can take a group photograph Uh, 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 please ask. Those who are speaking in between now, please ask some to mute them. Uh, Doctor Asmita Sharma, please mute your microphone. Please unmute my camera. Doctor Asmita Sharma, please mute your microphone. Thank you. Unmute my camera, please. Are you just? Yeah, it's okay now. I Okay, thank you, sir. All of you. Thank you, thank you, thank, Klaus. Thank, thank you for you. coming, Doctor Bipul and thank Prabhu, you. sir. Thank Dr. you, Doctor Nalle. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor Klaus. A lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Nalle, sir. Bridges. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Klaus, keep keep us guiding, ah, please keep us guiding. We'll we are not going to leave you. You know, we'll meet again, Klaus. Yeah. Klaus, sir, Klaus. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I am. I am. See, I am in my college at the moment. My 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 campus is open. You know, I am in the college. When it started, I was at home. But now I am in my college in campus. Ah. Yeah. So uh, what Professor Bridges is saying is that Professor Claus, uh, they are not going to leave you. They are again going to contact you for some future program. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I will <laughs> guiding us, sir. Keep guiding us. Yeah. I will contact yeah, you. In, let's stay in touch. Thank you, thank you. So nice of you. So nice. thank you, Doctor Bipul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, oh, Bipul sir. Bye. 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 Uh, Bipul, just one question: Could you send me a list of the countries participating? That would be very nice, and I will send you yes. a clean version of the presentation, which you can distribute. Thank yeah. you, uh, Professor Gurnule. Please send the list of the countries from uh, who participated in this webinar. Okay. Yeah. Please send a yes, mail sir. to. Yes, 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 yes. I, I will yeah. mail you. Sir, yes, yeah. yes. More than three hundred. More than three hundred were on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And, and no, no. More than four hundred. Four hundred. Total four hundred yeah, participants. And yeah, yeah. then send the list of the countries from where the participants were. Yes, yes, okay. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye, bye, bye. 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 So nice of you, Professor Cross. Thank you, sir.
थैंक यू प्रोफेसर क्लास थैंक यू प्रभु सर थैंक यू फॉर इनविटेशन थैंक यू गुरुनाले साहब थैंक यू गुरुनाले साहब सर थैंक यू विदाउट इट वाज वेरी वेल अटेंडेड इट वाज वेरी वेल अटेंडेड एंड एंजॉयड थॉरली मोर देन 90 मिनट्स रियली वंडरफुल यस सर यस सर थैंक यू प्रोफेसर गुरुनाले फॉर ऑल योर एफर्ट्स थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सर हार्टी कांग्रेचुलेशन गुरुनाले सर मैडम थैंक यू इट वाज अ प्रिविलेज टू लिसन टू प्रोफेसर क्लास एंड आई हैव यस आई हैव स्पेशली आई वर्क इन ग्रीन केमिस्ट्री and i come across his papers and he is uh, 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 research articles and i am fond of him and uh, it was really a privilege to listen to his talk thank you uh, dr charu thank you yeah thank you professor gundole i mean you have taken a lot of effort yes, and yes, professor sir. brijesh and professor prabhu thanks to yes, all sir. of you uh, thank, so thank you we'll have some other program in future definitely definitely okay, it was sir. very well attended and he really spoke very well really enjoyed yes, yes. right okay thank you bye थैंक यू बाय प्रोफेसर हेलो प्रोफेसर अजीज सर हेलो प्रोफेसर अजय अजीज हेलो प्रोफेसर अजीज सर हेलो हेलो गुरनुले सर दिस इज भावना देश पांडे कैन यू हियर मी यस यस सर थैंक्स अ लॉट सर इट वाज अ ब्यूटीफुल लवली लवली लेक्चर सर थैंक यू थॉरली एंजॉयड बट एक्चुअली सर आई जॉइन ऑन यूट्यूब सो आई वाज नॉट पार्ट ऑफ योर फोटोग्राफ आई मिस्ड इट बट बट या बट रेस्ट एवरीथिंग आई कुड आई आई हर्ड फ्रॉम द द बिगनिंग टू द एंड and really okay. very nice very informative okay. thanks a lot sir. thank you thank you madam thank you uh sir i also want to say something ha ah, yes so if you have uh, some uh, uh, such like lectures in future then uh, please uh, also uh, include me okay in okay. the webinar okay madam inform me it means i uh, you just inform me so that uh, it is really nice presentation by the dr uh, yes yes laws and uh, really so and uh, congratulations thank you madam and thank you for joining yeah it was wonderful uh, presentation given by the professor claus hello madam bajpay yes. madam ha uh, sir ji नमस्ते नमस्ते बोलिए सो मेनी कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन टू यू फॉर दिस नाइस प्रोग्राम सर आर यू लिस्निंग मी यस 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 मैडम हाँ मैडम बोलिए ना हेलो किरण मैडम बोलिए हेलो हाँ मैं बोली सर थैंक्स इनविटेशन यू ऑलवेज यू रिमेम्बर मी फॉर दैट दिस टाइप ऑफ प्रोग्राम टू यस टू सो आई कैन जॉइन यू ऑलवेज ओके सर ओके ओके यस हेलो हाँ हेलो हाँ आई एम प्रोफेसर पटवारी फ्रॉम नांदेड़ से ओके सर ओके ओके अभिनंदन फॉर नाइस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन थैंक यू सर Hello, best, best Professor Swami Nathan sir. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hello. 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 I am Dr. Swita Sharma from Sri Vishnu Vidya Pitha Shikhala. It's a very nice. Thank you, madam. <laughs>
palavra. Hello, sir. Is there any feedback link? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. yes, yes. It is there in chat box. Okay. Okay, sir. Yes.
YouTube चा लाईव स्ट्रीमिंग अजून काय दाखवायचं मला लोकांना